across so, so many of you here in person are in such a long gap of uh, virtual meetings and also to help people who are who is virtually online today. Minutes. <coughs> I have two lots of minutes to read tonight, so if you'll bear with me, it's uh, going to be a, a little bit longer than normal. Is the sound level okay, Daniel? Society of Antiquities of London, ordinary meeting Thursday, 8th of April, 2021. This meeting took place online only. Mr. Paul Drury, President and the Chair. The minutes of the previous ordinary meeting of Thursday, 25th of March, 2021 were read and will be signed at Burlington House, as they have been. The following communication was then laid before the Society. The Viking Phenomenon, Paradigms, Parameters and Progress by Professor Neil Price, FSA. Thanks for return for this communication. The President <coughs> announced that the next meeting will be the anniversary meeting on 24th of June, 2021, at which his term as president will come to an end. The president closed the meeting. And now the anniversary meeting. Society of Antiquities of London, anniversary meeting, Thursday, 24th of June, 2021, at 5 p.m., Burlington House and online. Mr. Paul Drury, president in the chair. The president thanked the four retiring council members Mr. Duncan Brown, Ms. Emma Carver, Dr. John Cooper, and Mr. Barney Sloan. Since the ballots for president, honorary secretary, and five ordinary members of council are uncontested, the president declared elected for 2021 to 24 the following President, Professor Martin Millett, honorary second secretary for a second term, Dr. Heather Spear, ordinary members of council, Dr. Robert Bewley. Ms. Victoria Bryant, Dr. Emily Cole, Dr. Timothy Schroeder, and Professor Rosemary Sweet. The officers and council members continuing for 2021 to 22 were its treasurer, Stephen Dunmore, OBE. Ordinary members of council, Professor Vincent Gaffney, Dr. Samantha Lucy, Vice President, Professor John Hines, Vice President, Ms. Natalie Cohen, The president then announced that following the ballots held on 17th of June and 24th of June 2021, the following were elected fellows of the Society of Antiquities. Tim Allen, Sir John Baker, Louise Barker, Helena Barraclough, Barbara Burley, Timothy Bolton, Chris Bryant MP, Steen Clemenson, Larry Cousins, Gareth Davis, Tudor Davis, Susan Fielding, Ben Ford, Alexandra Flank Franklin, Alexandra Guider, Catherine Haslam, Catherine Haslam, our curator at Kelmscott, Earl Havens, David Hoyle, Andrew Hutchison, Alison uh, Clavenas, Heather Knight, Simon Maslin, Carol Meal, Alex Mullen, Stuart Orton, Russell Palmer, Winifred Scutt, Fabio Silva, Peter Smithhurst, Samuel Turner, Lacey Wallace, and Robert Wellington. The meeting then approved the amendments to Order 5, and the meeting approved the appointment of Moore Kingston Smith LLP as the Society's Auditors for 2020-21. The President read out a list of names of fellows who had died since the last anniversary mm -hmm. meeting. And the president then read out a list of benefactors to the society for 2020 to 21, whom he thanked. The president then gave his anniversary address. Following that, on the motion of Stephen Dunmore, treasurer, the following resolution was carried. The thanks of the meeting be returned to the president for his address and that he be requested to allow it to be published. The president signified his assent. A second motion by Stephen Dunmore, Treasurer, to thank the President for his service throughout his presidency, 
and for guiding society with dignity and commitment was also carried. The president's chain was then passed from Mr. Paul Drury to Professor Martin Millet. The new president gave notice that the next ordinary meeting would be on Thursday, 7th of October, 2021, at which the society's medals would be presented and which will be followed by a reception for Mr. Paul Drury. The meeting was adjourned at 6.10 p.m. <coughs> Is it your pleasure if I sign these minutes as true and complete record? Yes. <coughs> Certificates. Thank you. There are eight certificates this evening, and I'm just reading the short version. If you want more information, please go on the website. Elizabeth Bakwadano, BA, MA, PhD, Honorary Senior Lecturer at the Institute of Archaeology, specializing in art history and archaeology of Mesoamerica, particularly the Aztecs of central Mexico. Rufus Bird, MA, Historic Collections Advisor and Curator, a specialist in furniture and collection, and he was the surveyor of the Queen's works of art until 2021. Christopher Bragg, Bachelor of Music, Head of Programming, University of St. Andrews Music Center, and Artistic Director of St. Andrews Organ Week. He is both a performing musician and a notable scholar on the history of the organ. Rhiannon Como, uh, MA, PhD, a landscape archeologist and historian, who specializes in early medieval Wales. Claire Dynam, MA, MPhil, PhD, a reader in Irish studies at the University of Liverpool and specialist in Irish language sources of the early Middle Ages with particular research interest in the Viking period. Dennis Duncan, BA, MA, PhD, a historian of books, translation and literature, as well as a practicing printer focusing on historical European printing techniques. David Fell, BA, MA, a field archaeologist with interests ranging from the Neolithic to the Roman period. Mary Flannery, BA, MPhil, PhD, Professor of Medieval <coughs> English Literature at the University of Bern. Thank you. Is it your pleasure that these certificates be suspended in the usual manner? Admissions. <laughs> The following, being in attendance and having signed the obligation required by the statutes, desires to be admitted a fellow. Andrew Rudd, Alexandra Guider. Andrew Rudd. Alexandra Guy. I'd like just to make a, one announcement before asking the Honorary Secretary to report on the Library Collections Committee meeting today. Um, many of you may be aware already that our General Secretary, John Lewis, has indicated his wish to retire at the anniversary meeting uh, next April. Um, the Council has been uh, exploring the uh, succession, if I can put it that way, over the summer. Um, we have uh, uh, recruited uh, Saxton Vampire to advise on the search for a new General Secretary. And I'm pleased to tell you uh, this evening that the advertisement for that post uh, will be going live tomorrow, uh, writing to all the fellows to draw their attention to it. Uh, the hope is that we can complete the search for the uh, 
successor to John uh, over the autumn and have um, someone uh, in place to uh, succeed John um, announced perhaps before Christmas and available to uh, take over the uh, job from John uh, in the spring. Um, but I'm delighted to hear from any fellows uh, who are interested in exploring the post. Uh, but the uh, process is being held, run by Saxon Banfire and a link to their website with details of the post will be coming around to all fellows tomorrow. Thank you. Heather. Thank you, Mr. President. We had a very good meeting of Library and Collections today, and um, our head of Library and Collections, Dunia Garcia Ontiveros, and team have been very busy. Um, I'll just give you the headlines because otherwise we'll be here all night. The library is now open three days a week, and you'd be pleased to know you can rise again and no need to book to come into the library. There's been lots of activity going on, lots of inquiries, and um, lots of work going on on barcoding and conservation and book cleaning, some with um, volunteers. And uh, as you I hope all know, the library catalogue was launched in July and is now live, um, which is fantastic. Um, in terms of manuscripts and archives, thousands of records of manuscripts and archives have been migrated into the new catalogue, which is now live as well. And digitizing of the digitization, sorry, of the society's own minute books and catalogues has started as well, <laughs> which is fantastic. In terms of collections management, that, that system is being updated as well, and lots of records being populated. And uh, just one example of conservation, we've obtained funding to conserve the 18th century portraits of fellows Martin Folkes, Jeremiah Miles, Edward Harley, and Samuel Gale. And I'm sure you'll all be familiar with those portraits, which is great. In terms of public engagement and outreach, I hope you all know we've had an online exhibition going on, Henry VIII, Defender of the Faith co-curated by our director, John Cooper, who unfortunately couldn't be here this evening, um, but also past president, Professor Morris Howard, who I think I saw in the audience, which is fantastic. There's been lunchtime lectures to go with the exhibition, and there've been some objects on display here at um, Wellington House as well. We've had over 2,000 visits to the exhibition so far, so that's fantastic. Uh, at Kelmscott, uh, the building works nearly completed and it's down now to the internal decoration and finishes. And Kathy Haslam and team have been very busy and are now wor working towards the opening exhibition, A Life Through Words, M William Morris and the Book, which will be the opening exhibition for, well, for the opening of Kelmscott again in April next year. So, uh, and I'd just like to personally thank all the team because they've really done wonders in the last few months, <laughs> despite everything. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. And uh, thank you again to the team for all the very hard work that's been going on uh, despite the difficulties of lockdown and so forth. Indeed. Pleasing thank you. Uh, to see all this activity happening and uh, the achievements on our library and collections. Um, it now falls to me to um, undertake one of the sort of greatest pleasures of. Uh, being president of this society, which is to um, deal with the uh, award of medals. Um, conventionally, this is done at the anniversary meeting, but it was decided because of the inability of people to attend because of COVID uh, that we would defer it until October. I'm glad to see um, so many of you here uh, to uh, take part in this today. Um, there are two medals to award. I'm going to say a few words about the gold medal, and then I'll pass over to um, uh, my predecessor, uh, Paul Drury, um, who is going to say a few words about the society's medal. Um, the gold medal of the society is the um, sort of most distinguished tribute to a practitioner um, in our subject areas. And it's an enormous pleasure this evening to uh, present that medal to Colin Lord Renfrew. Um, Colin uh, has been one of the most significant contributors to archaeology in the UK, Europe, and indeed the world um, over the last um, half century and more. 
Um, he began his career at the University of Sheffield in 1965, uh, remaining there as lecturer and reader um, until 1972, when he moved to be professor of archaeology at the University of Southampton, uh, before in 1981 uh, being elected as the Disney professor of archaeology at the University of Cambridge. At Cambridge, where he remained <coughs> as Disney professor until 2004, um, he's particularly uh, fondly uh, uh, remembered, I think, as the person who uh, found the money to found the MacDonald Institute of Archaeological Research, of which he was the uh, founding director. Um, he was also at Cambridge uh, Master of Jesus College uh, from 1986 to 1997. Since 2004, he hasn't by any means been idle, as well as his uh, duties in the House of Lords, which made life here in 1991. He's continued very actively in archaeological work, and until the last couple of years, has been active in field work um, in the Aegean. And it's for his work in the Aegean that he was first uh, known. His book, Before Civilization, uh, really explored the implications of the radiocarbon revolution for our understanding of Aegean prehistory and the connections between the uh, Near East, the Aegean world, Europe. And it's uh, uh, remarkable to me that that book, fantastic achievement at the time, um, still figures uh, very uh, heavily in undergraduate exam essays that I marked this year. Uh, just a considerable tribute uh, to its influence and its uh, importance, as well as its accessibility to generations of students. Colin's uh, work in the, uh, in the early part of his career was also um, formative in the development of archaeological theory in uh, UK archaeology universities. He was at the cutting edge of the introduction of thinking of new archaeology, uh, coming in partly from North American uh, social anthropological thought uh, in the 1960s and 70s. And through that, he was instrumental in the foundation of the Theoretical Archaeology Group, uh, whose conferences have become legendary since the first one in 1979. Uh, beyond these uh, sort of academic achievements in uh, the world of archaeological theory and the Aegean, his contribution has been enormous in, for instance, uh, thinking about the relationship between archaeology and language, uh, reflected in uh, some of, a number of his uh, publications. Um, his uh, work also in championing the uh, challenging of the um, antiquities industry and uh, illicit trade in antiquities, but he did an enormous amount of work on academically uh, both in Cambridge and politically behind the scenes uh, to uh, fight this uh, real threat to our heritage. And beyond being a prolific uh, academic uh, writer, he has also been a great communicator of the subject. I well remember um, watching uh, uh, him on television. Uh, it was uh, broadcast on uh, Orcadian prehistory uh, when I was um, a student. And he's continued to uh, champion uh, archaeology in a whole variety of ways. He continues uh, in his uh, work today. And uh, he is also perhaps uh, a live force in archaeology uh, that many of us will um, admire uh, for the book that all undergraduate students um, use in uh, studying archaeology, archaeology theories, methods, and practice, first published, I think, in 1991, wasn't it, Colin? And now, I think, in its eighth edition. And uh, it could be um, no better tribute, I think, to uh, one of the great thinkers of uh, archaeology in the UK world um, that his ideas are so influential on generations of undergraduate students. Beyond that, he is um, a champion of art, contemporary art, been a patron of that, 
anyone visiting Jesus College will still see the uh, physical manifestation of the patronage of uh, the arts whilst masked there. So with those um, few comments, which could have been elaborated very greatly, I invite uh, Colin to step forward to receive um, the gold medal of the Society of Antiquities. Stand. Sorry. Outstanding contribution to the um, the society, and um, above and beyond being a fellow, or indeed being a trustee, a member of council. I've known Stephen for many years. Um, our paths have crossed through work at what was then English Heritage and elsewhere. Um, I think he, he's applied himself to the work of the society with, with great dedication and rigor. First, as a member of council, um, I think in 2014, um, moving rapidly to um, becoming treasurer, the post he held for six years, but also above and beyond that, um, taking the lead in the redrafting of our statutes, both in 2014 and in the further uh, amendments last year, which led to the um, setting up of the ethical conduct body. A matter which called for deft handling in both, both occasions, particularly the latter, in developing the draft and get, getting general acceptance. And I, for one, as president in the hot seat last year, was extraordinarily grateful for the um, outcome, um, the adoption by an overwhelming majority of those amended statutes. So Stephen, for service beyond um, the uh, norm and well beyond, can I present you with the Society's Medal? Sorry, are we? Thank you very much. Sorry, I think you have. We need to hear Paul Belford, but um, it's very, very good to receive some recognition of all the time that I've actually spent dealing with society issues over the last 10 or 15 years. And uh, this is a fantastic reminder. Thank you very much. I, I, I should have added, um, as the first chair of our then newly established policy committee, which went with the job of treasurer, and still serving on that committee and producing, I hope still, um, the kind of quarterly briefing on matters of public policy, um, succinct and always um, uh, readable and therefore much appreciated by us all. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, 
Before I introduce our speaker, can I just say that this is our first um, attempt at a hybrid lecture. Um, when we come to the question and answer session at the end, um, we'll be taking questions from people in the room, um, as well as those who are joining us online. Can I ask those who have questions to raise in the room, if they raise their hand and wait for the microphone to be brought to them so that people online can hear. And those uh, online who wish to ask questions, use the chat function in Zoom or YouTube, and those questions will be conveyed to us in the room. With that little piece of uh, housekeeping, um, it brings us to the main business of uh, this evening which is to hear a paper um, by Paul Belford Fellow um, on recent field work on the hill forts and other earthworks in Wales. Uh, Paul is the chief executive of the Clugcowis Archaeological Trust. He has a long background, starting off, I think, at Sheffield, uh, where he was a student of John Collis uh, and uh, enthused him with the Iron Age. Uh, then working in field archaeology for a number of years, including a long period uh, running archaeology at the Iron Bridge World Heritage Site, uh, doing a PhD at the University of York before uh, moving uh, to uh, run uh, Clued Powers Trust. So it's a great pleasure. and Thank you for your patience in uh, waiting for the, to present this. Uh, it's a great pleasure to invite you to deliver your lecture. Paul. Thank you. Great. Well, Thank, thank you very much indeed for the introduction and good evening, ladies and gentlemen, fellows and guests and friends. It's a great honor to address the society in person after this COVID situation of the last 18 months. And to celebrate, I'm going to try and give two talks for the price of one. Where do you want me to move it to? Ah. Oh, look, there's a lighthouse. All right. Thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna you're gonna get two talks for the price of one, hopefully. Although I'm conscious it's half past five, I don't want to keep you from your wine too long. But I would like to introduce some recent work that um, the Clubhouse Archaeological Trust has been undertaking on hill forts and other earthworks in Wales. Now, I'm not sure that Wales needs an introduction, um, but just in case, there's Wales in dark blue. Um, two points to make here. First is that Wales, along with the rest of the archipelago, whose main islands are Ireland and Britain, is on the periphery of our continent. And the second is that Wales is very much at the centre of the archipelago culturally influenced by both of the main islands, as well as the wider Atlantic seaboard. So we're simultaneously at the edge and in, in the center. Now you may have seen some recent work on spectacular coastal hill forts in other parts of Wales, uh, Dinas Dinchle near Carnarvon, under threat from coastal erosion as a result of climate change, excavated by a colleague from the Gwyneth Archaeological Trust, uh, along with the National Trust and the Cherish Project. Uh, and Pendinas, overlooking Aberystwyth, excavated by colleagues from the David Archaeological Trust and the Royal Commission, with support also from the Cherish Project. But my focus this evening is neither of these two spectacular sites. I shall leave it to my colleagues from the other trusts to come here and talk to you about it in due course. Instead, I want to talk to you about the eastern side of Wales and this border landscape between Wales and England. This has long been a contested landscape, most famously through the long medieval period over a thousand years from the sixth to the 16th century. As A. E. Houseman put it, my heart, in my heart it has not died, 
the war that sleeps on seven side, they cease not fighting east and west on the marches of my breast. And we think of this area today as the marches, of course, but there is a much older borderland history. This stems from its topographic situation between the high ground to the west and the plains to the east. This is a simplistic dichotomy, of course, but broadly accurate. My emphasis will be less on the hills and the plains as on the rivers that cut through and between these highland and lowland zones. I want to focus particularly on this area in the central borderland, and I'll discuss two apparently very different types of earthwork monument from two different periods. First, let's look at hill forts. So this is our core territory, an area of around 3,000 square kilometers. Here is the modern layout of streets, uh, roads, railways, and settlements, many of which have medieval origins. The town of Shrewsbury is prominent on the right-hand side there, established in the eighth century on a strategic point, islanded in seven stream, as Houseman said, between Wales and England, and where Welsh is still spoken on the high street. Welsh pulled to the west uh, until the 18th century, the furthest navigable point on the River Severn, further upstream still, the planted market town of Llanidloes. To the north, Llanamunnoc and its famous limestone and copper mines. Further north again, and beyond this map, uh, but not beyond the talk, the market town of Oswestry. So it's on the edge, but this borderland itself has a cohesion. The border between England and Wales was fixed in 1536 under Henry VIII. Part of a series of changes which abolished the March Lordships and created much of the apparatus of our present day nations. Uh, the line of the border partly follows the River Bernwy, a tributary of the River Severn, and in places the border also follows the smaller watercourses meandering through the valleys. However, for the most part, this line has very few relationships with earlier markers in the landscape, both natural and human. Let's strip the landscape back to its bare essentials. The River Severn meanders from Llanidloes in the southwest to Ironbridge in the east. On its way, it's joined by the Vernwyr near Llanamunnoc, as we've already seen. This area mirrors in microcosm the broader division between upland and lowland. There are the Berwins in the northwest, uh, the Stipestones, Wenlock Edge, and the other blue remembered hills of Shropshire in the southeast. And what we have in abundance here are hill forts. In fact, there are 130 hill forts in this slide alone. Some of these are classic heroic hill forts, and I'll talk about these in a moment. Others are rather less spectacular enclosures of various forms and sizes, and not all of them, of course, are on hills. And this brings us to the question of definition. We've come a long way from thinking of hill forts in purely military terms, but we still don't fully understand their role. Were they arenas for trade and display? Were they for social, political, or spiritual gatherings? Were they territorial markers, expressions of collective identity? Did people live there all year round? Of course, any particular hill fort may have worked as all of these things at any one time and also at different times. The fact is we haven't really excavated enough to get a clear idea of the range of functional and social purposes to which hill forts were put in different places, both on a macro and micro scale, and, and I can't stress this enough, at different times. Chronology, I think, is a big problem. Earlier, I remarked that the long medieval period lasted more than a thousand years. No one would assume that the same social, cultural, political, and economic uh, positions, situations prevailed uh, at the beginning and the end of that period. And the same is true of the Iron Age. Of course, colleagues have made great strides in understanding hill forts. There has been some great work on hill fort location and, topo and typology by colleagues in Wales, notably by Ken Murphy of the Covered Archaeological Trust and Toby Driver of the Royal Commission. And I particularly urge fellows to read Rachel Pope's uh, really exciting and mind-blowing work on Iron Age societies and how they function, how they may have evolved over time, and what hill forts can tell us about these well-organized, peaceful, matriarchal societies. So back to Wales and the borderland and to our little study area. Now we do understand, at least partly, some of the chronology for a handful of the 130 hill forts on this map. And here they are. I'm sure that this distinguished audience is familiar with all of these, but a quick recap uh, may not do any harm. So let's start with Gervar. And this complex hill fort lies between the Severn and the Vernwy, is prominent in the landscape. 
The Gillsfield Hoard was discovered near here in 1862, uh, between here and Crowther's Camp, another hill fort not far away. This contained 120 pieces of late Bronze Age metalwork, perhaps buried around 700 BC. The hill fort, which is covered in woodland, has never been excavated. The Royal Commission surveyed here and identified a sequence of rebuilding and extension, but this remains undated. The Rekin is an iconic Shropshire landmark and a prominent outlier of the South Shropshire Hills. There are two hill forts here. The larger one probably dates to the Bronze Age and the smaller one is later. Nice interned entrances, if you can see that, uh, and thoroughly excavated uh, by Kathleen Kenyon in the 1930s. The site was partially obliterated in the 1960s by the BBC transmitter station, and subsequent watching briefs have not recovered any further evidence for the date of the Hillfort, no scientific dating here. <laughs> Similarly, Vreefolgen to the south, excavated about the same time by St. John O'Neill. The Hillfort dominates the Fertile Vale of Montgomery, an important tributary of the Upper Second Valley. Another Hillfort of possible Bronze Age origin with later modifications, final abandonment circa 300 BCE. Again, no scientific dating. And I have to say from my encounters with him in other parts of Wales and different types of archeology, span uh, O'Neill's findings uh, are not always as questioned as rigorously as they, as they could be. And to the north, we have another Bronze Age site, Llanamunnoc, which 57 hectares is the largest in Fort in Wales. The craggy hill itself provides a natural defense, which was enhanced in the Iron Age with a rampart. The site was valuable for its minerals, in this case, copper, with mining and metallurgy going on here into the Roman period and beyond. Main excavations in the 1970s, providing radiocarbon dates, and some smaller projects since then, uh, notably Bars in 2016. Finally, we come to the Brython, one of the best known hill forts in this area. Another well funded excavation with scientific dating, roundhouses, four poster granaries, waterlogged material, and complex phasing. A complete sequence from the Bronze Age through to the late first millennium, some reoccupation in the first century CE, and significant reoccupation from the adjacent, adjacent settlement at Deep Pieces in the 5th and 6th century. So there seems to be a general picture of Bronze Age foundation, Iron Age continuity, and then abandonment in the 1st or 2nd century BCE, perhaps with some reuse later on. And here in the middle, we have Beacon Ring, a small hill fort of local prominence seemingly, but not, and not of great significance. We're clearly a part of this group of hill forts. And it is significant, because Beacon Ring is the only hill fort anywhere in the world where, whose construction has been dated using optical spectrum luminescence or OSL data. So Beacon Ring is owned by us through Paris Archaeological Trust and we excavated here between 2017 and 2020. And we are of course very grateful to CADU for helping us fund the work and also giving us permission to excavate and other support came from Saxon University in the Netherlands uh, and from other partners you see here. So onto the excavations, which I shall summarize Briefly, a short monograph, slightly delayed, will be published later this year. We excavated in three main locations on the ramparts and also some trenches in the interior, which I've not shown here as we found no evidence for occupation. Uh, these are good sized trenches. Um, the ramparts are about 10 meters wide and stand up to eight meters high in places. They were built simply by heaping up the spoil from the excavation of the ditch. And so we found a buried soil horizon beneath the ramparts in more than one location. With a secure um, stratigraphic context for the buried soil, this is the perfect opportunity to try out scientific dating. We use radiocarbon dating and also optical spectrum luminescence data. Optical spectrum luminescence or OSL is a dating method that measures doses of ionizing radiation, that is X-rays or gamma rays, that have been received by sedimentary materials, specifically electrons in the crystalline structure of quartz grains. So when a layer of soil is exposed to sunlight, these electrons are energized, put into a state of excitation. When that soil is sealed, a phase known as storage, the agitation stops. When exposed again to what is known as stimulation light in the laboratory, the signature of the luminescence emitted reveals how long it has been in storage. Therefore, with care careful sampling and analysis, it's possible to tell when a buried soil horizon was last exposed to sunlight and thus to date the feature that was built over the top of it. For OSL dating to work, the sedimentary context, the whole context, needs to be understood. So as well as the buried soil horizon itself, samples need to be taken from above and below. 
and a beacon ring, you can see the sequence here. The field measurement showed that the buried soil arrives and produced a different luminescence signature from the surrounding layers. And this was confirmed by laboratory testing, which suggested that this soil had been buried roughly between 400 and 300 BCE. So we can say that the rampart was probably built in the late Iron Age. However, the stratigraphic evidence from our excavations, together with certain features observed during the survey, strongly suggested that the hill fort had never been completed. It had been abandoned at a fairly advanced stage of its construction, but never actually finished. So here we have an unfinished hill fort, never used, built at about the same time that all the other hill forts are supposedly going out of use. Was Beacon Ring part of an intended territorial expansion that never happened? Was it a response to internal securities? Insecurity. Was it a response to an external threat? What about symbolic intent? Perhaps the act of building a rampart sends a sufficient message to whoever it was aimed at. Mobilizing labor is itself a demonstration of power, influence, and control. And this is not the only unfinished hill fort, either locally or elsewhere in Wales. And there are lots of examples in Shropshire, but I'll come to another example in South Wales. We've be recently been excavating at Tumbalum in South Wales. I'm very sorry. Well, how far back do you need to go? I, could, I can stay there, that's fine. Okay, so we've been recently excavating at Tumbalum in South Wales. This is another iconic site, famous for the tump, uh, which you see on the right-hand photograph, which may or may not be a Neolithic cairn or medieval mott. Um, interestingly, our excavations here also suggest that the ramparts were unfinished, at least left to peter out around the back, and the site was never occupied, despite, or perhaps because of, its extremely prominent location. It's very windy up there. We have recovered samples for radiocarbon dating from the base of the rampart and the base of the ditch, and these are being processed as we speak. And it's also worth mentioning at this point that we have been supporting recent work by a local group at Old Oswestry, led by our own Tim Malin, and supported by a grant from the Society of Antarctica. Uh, they've cut two trenches across the top and bottom ramparts to investigate how they've been constructed and again to take samples for scientific dating. The upper rampart, which is five metres wide, was constructed in box rampart style with a stone revetment wall and a hard core in the centre. The lower rampart was built in a very different way, uh, consisting of dumps and clay and stone to make a single bank, rather like a beacon ring. Unlike Tumbalum and beacon ring, Old Oswestry clearly was finished and also occupied as excavations early in the 20th century suggested. Geophysics has so far proved promising, and again, further results are forthcoming. So what was going on in the Iron Age and what happened next? First, let's consider the hill forts in their context. This is a view from the Rekin looking west. It's only about a hundred degree field of view, but even here we can see a huge number of hill forts. Well, now, intervis intervisibility between hill forts has long been considered, of course, and to some extent this is a function of the intervisibility of hills, and so the significance of these relationships need to be qualified and considered in context, context of space and context of time. So starting with space, an obvious feature here is the River Severn, which was in flood when this photograph was taken, so it shows up very clearly in the foreground, middle distance, I suppose. Here we are on our map, here's the confluence and its hill forts, some of which we saw in the photograph. And it's possible to suggest that these hill forts have a relationship to the rivers. Whether they're controlling the rivers in a military sense is another matter, but they're certainly commanding the landscape in broad terms. And so one might expect a relationship between these sites and with trade along the river valleys. And perhaps the confluence is particularly important. Looking north from the Bryden towards Llanamunnock, the two rivers are clearly visible. Incidentally, the modern England Wales border runs down the middle of this photo, highlighting the borderland as a central place with a cohesive landscape. It's not possible driving from one side to the other without road signs to know that you're at one minute in England and the next minute in Wales. Looking down or up the Severn Valley, yes, there's Beacon Ring, but we also get a good sense of the valley itself. Now, Rachel Pope has argued that a regionally focused and evidence-based approach is the best way to develop a coherent social narrative rooted in its temporal context. I would agree. 
but we're clearly some way from doing that here at the Seven Vernary Conference. And the reason for that is that we don't understand the second context, that is time. So to understand what's going on here or anywhere else for that matter in the Iron Age, we need to have dates and lots of them. Dates for construction, dates for use, dates for reuse, dates for abandonment. Only then can we really understand the full nature of the relationships of the spaces within, between and around these hillforts. So let's consider what happens next. This is a borderland landscape and this character is rooted in topography rather than politics. So it transcends periods. Modern border is a line drawn in the middle of this borderland in 1536. As I say, there's no time to talk about the later medieval history, the march of lordships that led up to this moment. But it's worth mentioning in passing that the early 16th century marked the beginning of a chronological boundary or border between medieval and modern. Now, there are lots of examples of medieval reuse of hill forts and for that matter, other prehistoric sites, which I can't go into at great length, here, but there are two local medieval examples from among many, and you'll see that I've placed them on the wrong sides of the border to which they relate, but there we are. Um, Cow's Castle was built in the 11th century and a planned borough was planted here in the 12th century by the Corbett family, allies of Roger de Montgomery, Earl of Shrewsbury. Dinas Bran was built in the 1260s by Griffith ap Madoch, uh, Prince of Paris and an ally of Prince Llewellyn ap Griffith. Early medieval reuse of hill forts is harder to find. However, Beacon Ring dramatically re enters this story in the seventh century. At this time, Northumbria was the dominant kingdom in what is now England, with Gwynedd on the ascendancy in Wales. Cadwallon of Cadvan was king of Gwynedd in the 620s and 630s and defeated the kill and killed King Edwin of Northumbria. According to later Welsh poets, part of this struggle took place here. Cadwallon used Beacon Ring as his camp where poetically, of course, he stayed for seven months and carried out seven skirmishes every day for all that time. Cadwallon did not hold Northumbria for long, and in time that kingdom lost its dominance. For the next three years, what is now England was dominated by Mercia, and meanwhile the princes of Powys had become preeminent in Wales. One well-known king of Mercia was Offa in the later 8th century. A European statesman and diplomat Offa is perhaps best known for the linear earthwork that marked the western boundary of his kingdom. And so here we are again on the edge of somewhere. But these linear earthworks actually serve to reinforce the borderlands landscape and identity. Offa's dyke uh, made use of a number of hill forts, including Llanamunach, where it is anchored into the Iron Age ramparts. Watt's dyke, a parallel and probably broadly contemporary linear earthwork, is similarly connected to the ramparts of Old Oswestry Hill Fort, which we saw earlier. Offers Dyke and Watts Dyke are all about seeing and being seen in the landscape. Although they are very different types of earthwork from the hill forts that were constructed a thousand years or more earlier, they have equally strong relationships with the topography through which they pass. And of course, the hill forts were still there then as they are now. Now, to talk about some of our work on offers and what dikes, I need to expand our view slightly beyond this now familiar territory. So here's the big picture again. And the specific sites I want to talk about today are slightly further to the north in Wrexham and Flintshire. They are Chirk, Erzig, and the Greenfield Valley. But before I do that, I would like to briefly remind fellows of the vulnerability of some of these earthworks. You may recall a few years ago that a section of Offers Dyke near Chirk a schedule section, no less, was seriously damaged. This generated a blizzard of headlines, uh, and in the end, it was not possible to prosecute. And the reason for this was because the 1979 Ancient Monuments and Archaeological Areas Act, almost uniquely in English and Welsh law, had a defense of ignorance get out clause. But two silver linings emerged from this cloud of destruction. One was that the historic part of the Historic Environment Wales Act passed in 2016 made it much harder for the defense of ignorant, ignorance to be applied in Wales. And in fact, since that act has been passed, we have seen a number of prosecutions of damaged cases in Wales. So that's very positive. The other silver lining of this cloud was that with some emergency funding from CADU, we were able to go in and take samples for radiocarbon dating from the damaged section of the dike. Unfortunately, whether it was because of the damage or the sampling strategy or the nature of the stratigraphy, 
these dates were very mixed and did not really advance our understanding of the chronology of the times in any meaningful way. Of course, a lot of time and energy has been spent exploring offers and what's dikes over the years. Again, our work stands on the shoulders of giants. Cyril Fox's ambitious study of the 1920s and 30s was the first to seriously explore chronology. The Offers Dyke project, run by David Hill and Margaret Worthington, followed in the 1970s and 80s. And small pieces of work have often made significant contributions. Paul Everson and colleagues from the English Royal Commission examined Offers Dyke's relationship to Regent Furrow near Montgomery. And our own Tim Mallon did pioneering work with OSM on Watts Dyke in Shropshire. A big picture overview has recently been presented by Keith Ray in the traditions of, and at times quite literally in the footsteps of, Sir Cyril Fox. And a lot of other big picture work in recent years, albeit largely from perspectives on the east of the border, has given some really helpful content. And finally, I must mention the contribution of Howard Williams from the University of Chester. As well as his own work, he has tirelessly supported the work of other scholars, co-founding the Offers Dyke Collaboratory and the Offers Dyke Journal, evoking debate, discussion, and generally raising, raising the profile of linear earthwork studies. And there is a huge and ongoing contribution through planning-led development-driven work, which encounters bits of these earth works that are no longer visible above ground. And here's just a handful of examples. And some of this work led to wider synthesis, funded by CADU for heritage management purposes. And this included, from our point of view, a condition survey of both offers and Watts Dykes in Wrexham, and support for the conservation management plan developed by Andre Berry. So this is the background against which the projects I'm talking about today have taken place. First, we come to Erthig and Watts Dyke. Erthig is a National Trust property just outside Wrexham. Our project was jointly funded by CADU and the National Trust. The house sits just east of the line of Watts Dyke, which runs through the trees here. A parkland landscape was created by William Eames in the 1770s. Eames landscaping retained early picturesque features, including a motton bailey and part of Watts Dyke, but flattened the dyke near to the house to create a lawn. This part, perhaps inevitably, was unscheduled, and there was no real trace of the bank on the ground. Well, you can see here the base of the bank was intact below the 18th century lawn. In fact, it was nine meters wide and survived to a height of three meters, three quarters of a meter, sorry, not three meters. More impressive was the survival of the ditch, which was seven meters wide and one and a half meters deep. The dike had been leveled simply by pushing the bank into the ditch, and so deposits at the base of the ditch were well preserved. We were able to take samples for radiocarbon dating and for OSL dating from the primary fill of the ditch, which is shown here in yellow, and the base of the bank in brown. And we also found an earlier pit beneath the bank and took some samples from that. The results were delayed rather frustratingly due to COVID and the closure of the Suet Laboratory for the best part of the year. And there are a number of methodological issues with how we sampled and collected some of the data, which I don't really have time to go into here, but I'm, I'm happy to, to go in when we come to questions, if there are questions about that. So there are some caveats around the dates, but will be published in the Office Dyke Journal very shortly. Um, so I can say that the bank and ditch are certainly post-Roman, and the pit beneath the bank is prehistoric. So we come to Office Dyke and to Church Castle, a few miles south of Erwig, and also a National Trust property. As well as the National Trust in Cadu, our work here has been generously supported by the Cluidian Range and Dee Valley AONB. The castle was built in 1295 by Roger de Mortimer, bought by Thomas Middleton in 1595, and partly demolished and rebuilt after the Civil War. There's a very interesting archaeology of the castle, which I don't have time to go into again. Here also the dike runs just to the west of the castle and through the ground. William Eames was also responsible for this landscape again in the 1760s, 1770s, which swept away a formal Baroque garden and introduced a picturesque lake, which submerged, submerged part of Offa's dike. And you can see the dike running through the middle of the lake in the bottom photograph here. And when the weather was particularly dry in uh, 2018, the, the dike sort of rose again from the waters of the lake. The dike is very clear on the LIDAR image uh, running north to south, um, bending slightly as it comes up from the valley, the river Dee, um, west of the castle and through the lake. 
Uh, there are also a complex set of prehistoric and later field systems which have been fossilized by the embankment. Uh, the dike was leveled by Eames near the lake so that the water could be seen from the castle, and as a result, this area was unscheduled, and so we were able to explore the line of the dike. And here's our trench, looking across the line of the dike towards the castle with our backs to the lake. Very steep profile to the ditch, and as at Irvig, the rump of the bank also survived, in this case about seven metres wide and just under half a metre high. You can see the line of the bank running back under the trees in the right background. And here is the ditch, a very impressive profile with an ankle breaker at the bottom. Rather to our surprise, there's nothing like this had been found in previous excavations. The ditch here is about six meters wide and just under three meters deep. Most of the upper part of the fill relates to the 18th century landscaping, um, but you can see the darker, denser primary fills uh, towards the base of the ditch. And again, there was an earlier pit underneath the bank. We were able to take samples for radiocarbon and OSL dating, and I'm afraid it's the same story as before, but publication is imminent, I promise you. I can say that those parts of the earthwork that we've excavated are not prehistoric, they are not Roman, and nor are they post-medieval, so there's a big clue as to where they might sit in the chronology, but watch this space. Finally, we come to the far north of our region, so the Greenfield Valley, a heritage park in Flintshire. It lies between the iconic medieval sites of St. Winifred's Well at Holywell and Basingwork Abbey, shown here, um, which, for, which was for a time under the patronage of Llewellyn the Great. Watts Dyke runs through the park uh, between these important sites and also close to the medieval castle mound at Holywell. Our work here took place as part of improvements to the active travel network cycle path. To cut a long story short, we excavated two trenches across Watts Dyke, unlike previous ex excavations, but as at Beacon Ring, we were able to work closely with our colleagues from Suwark to undertake detailed OSL profiling in the field. And as at Beacon Ring, this provided really useful insights into soil formation and deposition processes, and in both trenches we were able to identify original ground surfaces. Again, as well as the OSL work, we were also able to take samples for radiocarbon dating, and these will be published later this year. We also discovered a 25 meter upstanding length of Watts Dyke within the park that had never previously been identified and was unscheduled, which makes the point rather also that Keith Ray would make that there is a lot more to be done and a lot more of this supposedly well-known monument to be discovered. Nevertheless, with all of this work, and I'm sorry I can't share the results in detail with you this evening, uh, I have to respect the confidentiality of our partners and, and funders. Uh, we are beginning to refine our understanding of the dates of these monuments and also refine our understanding of how to deploy the methodologies, especially OSL. But the fact remains that these are the only bits we have excavated and subjected to scientific analysis and dating. They are mere pinpricks in the 130 kilometer length of Offers Dyke. We can assume thanks to Keith Ray's detailed analysis of the relationship of the earthwork to its landscape, that it was designed by one mind and constructed as a single project. But we don't know that for certain. Nor indeed are we able to discuss any aspect of its later existence, places where it might have been modified or reinforced it, or in some way adjusted to suit later political circumstances. So as with hill forts, chronology is a big problem. Whether we're looking at the Iron Age or the medieval period, these are big spans of time. These earthwork monuments require significant mobilization of resources to create them and maintain them. Therefore, they can only have been built at times when society was both able to afford and build them, and also when it needed them. If we could really narrow down when those times were across large numbers of sites, then we might be able to understand a little bit more about the ebbs and flows of past cultural society. And this is what I mean by large numbers of sites. Imagine what we could say about later prehistory if we knew what, when every single one of these 130 enclosures was constructed and abandoned. And then if we took that as our starting point, what sort of questions could we then begin to ask? Oops, earlier on, you heard a brief biography of me in which inspired by the formative landscapes of my youth, and by people like John Collison instead, I enthusiastically embraced later prehistory. But I did become dissatisfied, I have to say, with chronological vagueness. 
Of course, chronologies of individual science can be fairly certain, but these seem to me merely islands in a sea of chronological unknowns. So I embraced urban, medieval, and historical archaeology essentially out of laziness. The, the chronology was already there, and so it was immediately easier to explore themes about power and exploitation, domination, and resistance, and so on. Of course, people much cleverer than me can and do explore these themes in prehistory. But if all we have are islands of chronological certainty, be they hill forts or sections of linear earthwork, then it becomes much harder. Not just for us as archaeologists, but for the public, whom we all ultimately serve, to understand the significance and fragility of the landscapes around us. This, by the way, is another view from the Rekin, looking southeast in this case towards Abdon Berth. An early morning temperature inversion a couple of weeks ago kept the cloud in the valleys, and so the hilltops and hill forts appear as islands above the cloud, illustrating my metaphor. Uh, so to conclude, um, the common theme has been earthworks, of course. Some are circular, some are linear, some are prehistoric, and some are medieval. But they all present the same sorts of problems around dating them, and OSL dating seems to offer a solution which can help us where radiocarbon cannot. Dating alone is not enough, of course. We also need to understand context and landscape, and I think Rachel Pope's argument for regionally focused and evidence-based approaches is very powerful. And indeed, it's the only way, really, we can develop narratives that have meaning in time and place. And so this brings me to the other theme here, which is place and specifically borderlands. As I said at the beginning, the borders are the edges of places, but they're also central places in their own right. Here we are in the heart of London, and Shrewsbury and the Welsh marches seem very peripheral. When you're there, here, you are, of course, at the centre of the world. So it's time to break down some borders. First, I think we need to reach across administrative borders. We need to consider borderlands as landscapes in their own right. Moreover, these are landscapes of long duration, which outlive the polities which rise and fall around them. Therefore, secondly, we need to reach across the disciplinary borders that we ourselves have created. We need to think as widely and as openly as possible to take our discipline forward and to enable greater human understanding about the past. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Paul. Uh, can I, uh, aside from the content of your lecture, these images are really splendid. They're lovely photos. We, we congratulate you on them. Um, uh, can I uh, open the floor to questions? Um, I just wanted to um, kick off with, with one question about OSL, which um, is clearly central to your thinking on this. And um, uh, I think a number of us have seen the beginnings of a sort of OSL revolution in uh, later prehistory and so forth. Um, in terms of the practicability of uh, using it, uh, you seem to have had mixed picture of uh, success and difficulty. I wonder whether you'd like to just say a little bit about the, the challenges of using OSL in these contexts. Yes, I think for us it's been a very steep learning curve, and I must preface any remarks I do make, and, and Justine can tell you this, um, I'm not a scientist, I'm not an archaeological scientist at all, and, um, but it has been a steep, a steep learning curve for us, um, and we've been very used to taking samples from suitable looking material, which is, which is what we do when we deal with radiocarbon bits, we take spot samples. In fact, what we've learned by getting the SUERC team down on site is that there's a very complex relationship between the different sediments, how they're formed, how they arrive in the features, and the relationship to the, the, the sort of background radiation that's going on in those features, whether they're cut features or not. Um, so actually taking a sample or even a series of samples on the site from a, a layer that you think might be useful actually isn't going to help. Um, you need that full sequence of depositional events yeah. from the very beginning right to the very end mm. and in some cases such as quite a narrow ditch section we found this in the the ankle breaker mm. at, at off the site 
you know, the, the narrowness of the trend right at the bottom meant that there was some degree of contamination or interference from the, the sediments actually in the natural underneath. Mm. Um, so my, I mean, it was still, we are still very much at the early stage of this, and I think that we've had the best results when we've had the sewer guys on site who've come down, they've taken profiles, it's more expensive, mm. but it's, it's ultimately more satisfying. And so although I've called for, um, let's date all of the monuments everywhere, I think we've only, we've only been successful where we can do that in the context of an excavation. So coring, for example, mm. wouldn't work, I think, unless you've been there before. So that, that would be my answer. Thank you, Paul. Can I ask any questions from the room or um, online? John. Can you hear me? Yes. I can, yeah, I can hear that. Um, Paul, very interesting you talked about the, uh, the enclosed sites. Um, what about all the stuff in between of the first millennium BC, unenclosed sites? Uh, are there are a lot of those. Any uh, inclination how they sort of link up with the defended sites? Anything approaching field systems? I don't suppose there are. And anything in between the dots? The, it's fragmentary. There are bits in between in between the dots, certainly. Um, and in some places, such as the Upper Seven Valley, you know, there, there's quite a lot. Um, south, south, um, East Wales as well. There's, there's potentially quite a lot. Um, but we're nowhere near really understanding the complexity of the, of the landscape and the hinterland of these settlements. And I think that's, that's for two reasons. I think a large part of that is there just hasn't been the intensity of um, excavation that there has been in, in parts of England. Um, we don't see development on the same scale in large parts of rural Mid Wales um, that would generate the sort of developer funded data that we see you know, we're still waiting for HS4 to Mahuntleth, and when that comes, then, you know, maybe that will bring with it a sweep of new information. So I think there's just, there's less field work going on. You know, maybe we're, we're too cautious in, in calling for mitigation in that sense. I think also there, there are issues around the, the, the geology and, and soil types. And I think, again, we haven't really harnessed the potential of LIDAR. We haven't seen LIDAR in anything like the kind of resolution that would begin to detect some of these more complex and nuanced field systems and field boundaries um, at a really fine-grained scale, so, uh, certainly not yet in Wales. And again, when LIDAR, LIDAR does come on stream, people are very fond of going and doing really whizzy images of hill forts and really exciting images, but actually it's that painstaking trawling through and, and, and looking for stuff. So I'm not saying it's not there, I just, I just think it's, it's going to take quite a lot of effort to, to find it. Hope that helps. Thank you for the uh, talk. Um, I wondered how much uh, you feel that is a hindrance that there is a national border running through this archaeological area. How does that impact on the understanding on either side? Uh, and is it possible to get a coordination across that frontier? so that we can get sort of equal effort on either side of the border? I, I think it can be a hindrance, be, partly because the respective state heritage bodies can't operate in each other's domain. And they, there is a, a differential between funding for Historic England and funding for CADU and the, and the capacity for English heritage to do things is not necessarily mirrored on the other side of, of the border. So there's that. There are, there are structures and mechanisms like archaeological research frameworks, which are designed to help overcome some of the issues between academic and um, pra practicing archaeology. And again, they all stop at county borders and or um, national borders. So you have strange and pointless concepts like Mesolithic Wales or Roman Worcestershire, which don't really help. Um, so it can be a barrier, and certainly in terms of funding and project development, 
it, it is, I think, potentially a hindrance. On the other hand, it can be overcome. And, you know, we have very good personal relationships with our colleagues in, in Shropshire in particular, and we've developed a series of, of projects looking at um, particularly quite small landscapes in the Shropshire Hills AOMB. But there's no reason why we couldn't develop a, a cross-border project with our colleagues in, in Shropshire. Recently, of course, Cadu and Historic England have jointly funded the post of an Offers Dyke uh, conservation person who's going to be hosted by Shropshire Council, but with a remit to roam on both sides of the of the border and deliver some of the positive conservation outcomes that, that we we aspired to deliver in the in the conservation management plan. So that I think signposts the way forward. So I'm ending on a positive note, Andrew, but yes, it, it can be very frustrating. And particularly as so, to someone like me who lives on one side of the border and works on the other side and you know can travels through that landscape every day. Does that help answer your question? Um, what next in terms of project development is there? How long is a piece of string? Where do you want, in terms of which project? Any projects or just all projects? Or is that, does, is that the question? That, that's all it says, along with thank you. Um, well, we'd like to do more, and we'll ask uh, Cadu and anyone else to give us money to do more. I mean, I, I think we, we've been quite frustrated by the lack of not our lack of ambition, but sometimes the lack of ambition in terms of doing projects, whether it's longer stretches of, of dike or whether it's more hill forts. Um, and I, I think that, you know, we, we would like to do, to do more, get more comparative data. I think we've, we've, done, we've done Beacon Ring, but it'd be really nice to look at some of the other hill forts in that cluster of hill forts around the Seven Bernary Confluence, go back to earlier excavation information and, and draw some stuff out of that. I mentioned Gava. Again, the Royal Commission surveyed that. There's tentative phasing, it's in woodland. It'd be nice to whack some holes in that and date that. Um, so, really, the, the project plan is to do more archaeology. I think. I don't know if that answers the question, but it's got to be the answer, isn't it? Dig more holes. Welcome back. Express our. Uh... Thanks to Paul for uh, introducing this topic to us in oh. such a period. You have got some more. Oh. Sorry. Um, can, can I uh, express um, our thanks to you again, Paul, uh, for uh, sharing your research in such a, a, a clear and stimulating way this evening? Thank you very much indeed. Very we much. wish you well for, for future research. Um, in this landscape, which is so alluring, as you've shown us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. I give notice that the next meeting will be on Thursday, the 14th of October at 5 p.m., when we will hear a paper revisiting the origins of prehistoric Malta, Temples, Landscape and Change, the work of the ERC a uh, Fragsus project by Caroline Malone, FSA. Uh, a wine reception follows. Please uh, do join us. Ah, it's in the library for those who are online. <laughs> <laughs>